nobody else has a song, let's open our Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 73, Psalm 73, we pray for the message tonight, it's our desire that God's people be fed, that you be blessed by the word of God here tonight. When you find your place, we'll know you're ready when we're all standing. If you're able, we're going to begin reading here at verse 25 in Psalm 73, and I'm going to read 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee? My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we come once again in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for the reading of this scripture from Psalm 73 and the hearing of it to our hearts. And Lord, as this message goes forth tonight, I pray that lives would be impacted, that souls would be stirred, and that your perfect will would go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you for standing. You may be seated in the house of God. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So in this message tonight, we're dealing with the question, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? And I believe the answer to that question is, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism rightly gives, is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Think about that. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. God has made it very clear to us that mankind was created for a purpose. You're not here uh, just by random chance. You're here because God created you to be here for a purpose. And that goes for each and every one of us in this house tonight, everybody watching online, and everybody else in this entire world. God created us for a purpose, and the purpose is for the glory of God. That's the ultimate reason that we were all created. We were created for His Glory, And that's the ultimate reason we're alive today, for the glory of God. Because man is not an end in and of himself, but man is an instrument to be used for a specific person. So let's think about it like this. Let's suppose that I want to go and buy a new car, and that's a very tall daydream at this point in time in my life, but let's say that I buy this new car and I decide that I want to drive it down to the lake, and I want to drive it down to the end of the pier and on into the water. Now, should I expect that car to perform like a boat just because it's a good car? Just because it's a new car? If I were to attempt such a thing, well, I'd just be out of car because that car is going to drop down into the water and it's going to sink and it's going to be ruined and it's going to be a major failure <coughs> and it's going to be a major loss because I expected my car to act like a boat and now I don't have a car. Or let's say, let's say I have some, some sawing that I need to do. And this is not a very good piece of wood, but I had it laying around so I believe it will serve the purpose. Let's say that I had some sawing that I needed to do. I'm going to cut this piece of wood down to the size that I need it to be. See a problem? Yes, all that with the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to take me a long time to get through this piece of wood with this hammer, right? Yeah. Why? Because, yeah, exactly right. And it's not going to be a very precise cut because this hammer wasn't created for the purpose 
of sawing through a piece of wood. It's not going to work. Or let's suppose that I've got some hammering that I need to do. I found this cute little saw laying in my building today. I don't even know where it came from. But let, let's check it out. I've got some hammering I need to do, okay? You need to hit it a little bit harder. Hit it a little bit harder? I'm afraid I'm going to break my saw. I'm not even going to try it that way. It's just going to shatter. It's not going to work, right? Because that saw was not created for the purpose of hammer. And my hammer was not created for the purpose of being used as a saw. And it's just like that car was not created for the purpose of being used as a boat. But you know, we do this sort of thing in our spiritual lives also. Amen? Y'all with me? We do this sort of thing in our spiritual lives and the, and, and the stupidity of it all is very obvious. We were created by God for a purpose. We were created to be a precision tool designed for a specific function. But oftentimes, we will try to apply ourselves to everything except what it is that God has created us to do. We'll try to be busy doing anything and everything except what we ought to be doing. What it is that God has called us to do. That specific job that we were designed to accomplish. God created us for the function of His service and His glory. And when we live our lives for some other reason, then we are misusing ourselves and we are abdicating our responsibility before God. And this is a great source of frustration for modern man today because he's running away from God and he's running away from the purpose for which God created him to accomplish. No matter what he does, it doesn't fit. He can't seem to find himself today because he is too busy running away from his created purpose, which is the glory of God. So we're never going to find ourselves until we acknowledge God uh, and discover His purpose for our lives, nor will we ever be able to begin to truly live until we begin to live for Him. I'm going to say that again. You're not going to truly begin to live until you truly begin to live for Him. Amen? It was August, uh, Augustine who said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee. So, I'll tell you a little bit about my testimony. Prior to coming to the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 26, and I just turned 47, so I've been saved now by God's marvelous grace for just over 20 years. And I thank God for that. But prior to coming to Christ at 26 years old, I spent all of my days trying to live life in terms of Vern instead of in terms of God. Just to be honest with you, I wasn't living my life in terms of God and time would fail me to tell you of all the problems and all the struggles that fell upon me as a result. And every day of my life was empty. And every day of my life was miserable. And I didn't mind telling people about it either back then. My common response when somebody would come up to me, whether I was at work or, or just out in public, and somebody would come up to me and say, Hey, how you doing? My common response would be, Well, I'm miserable. Life is miserable. I didn't know my purpose. I thought my purpose was to make myself happy. And in order to do that, that meant I needed to make more money. And since I couldn't seem to work enough hours to make enough money for me to be happy in life, I determined that life was just miserable and I was doomed to repeat the same cycle for the rest of my days, get up in the morning and go to work anywhere from 8 to 10 to 12 to 16 hours a day, go home and go to bed and get up and do the same thing over again the next day. Just to barely scrape by because I was not living in terms of God. I was living in terms of myself. 
but the Lord saved me. Praise His holy name. And when the Lord saved me, all of that began to change. So the purpose of our lives is only understandable in terms of God. And the more we try to live our lives apart from God and ignoring God, the more meaningless our lives will be and the more frustrating our lives are going to be. The more we try to live for ourselves, the less alive we become. This is exactly why Jesus said this. I'm going to Matthew chapter 10. And I'll be flipping a couple more places in the Bible if you want to keep your Bible handy. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. I want to read this to you. Verse number let me read verses 38 and 39 in Matthew chapter 10. Verse number 38 says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Christian people, beloved, have got to make up our minds every day that we're going to carry the cross. That we're going to carry the cross that we have been given to carry in this life because we do have a cross to carry. And we must be content to lose even life itself for the sake of the Lord Jesus. We must be willing to lose the favor of men for the sake of Jesus. We must be willing to endure hardships and trials and, and persecutions. And we've got to be willing to deny ourselves or we're never going to reach heaven. So as long as the world and the flesh and the devil are what they are today, we're, we're going to continue to have an exaggerated or a distorted concept of what life is, is supposed to be if we're not looking to God to find the answer for that. So remember, we're talking about what is the chief end of man tonight. And this is the, the great paradox of life, but it becomes clear and understandable when we see God and we know God as creator and we recognize the truth of Romans chapter 11. I'm going to Romans chapter 11, verse number 36. We need to recognize the truth of this verse. Romans 11, 36. Here the Bible says, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So not only is God the source of all life, but he is also the source of all purpose. And he is the source of all meaning. There is no purpose and meaning attached to our lives without God. Amen? Without God, our lives are meaningless. Without God, our lives have no purpose. So every act of grace is owed to God as the first cause. He produced it for His own glory and by His own will. So Paul said this in 1 Corinthians, if you want to flip on over a little bit more, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here the Apostle Paul writing here, he had this to say by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Verse number 31 says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do, we are to do for the glory of God. If we don't do it for the glory of God, then we're misusing ourselves. We're like that hammer trying to saw through a board or that saw trying to hammer a nail. We've got to do what we do for the glory of God. And the principle here is clear. As Christians... We are to be more concerned about the glory of God than we are our own rights. Everything in life, eating, drinking, shopping, schooling, playing, trading, everything, everything in life has to be subordinate to the glory of God. The glory of God has got to be first. The glory of God has got to be preeminent. And since it is, in fact, man's chief end to glorify God, as we said at the beginning, everything else that we could ever do outside of glorifying God is just a complete waste of time. Everything else that we could ever do outside of bringing glory to God is just a complete waste of the life that God's given us. 
and it equates to a living death. A living death. But on the other hand, all activity that we engage in for the glory of God, it will never be futile. It's always going to be completely free from futility. Not only is it free from futility, but we can rest assured that everything that we do for the glory of God is going to have perfect results. Now that doesn't mean that we're perfect. Because nobody's perfect, right? Except Jesus. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. And that doesn't mean that you're never going to fail or come short when you try to glorify God. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that when we operate according to His grace, God is able to take even your most feeble effort at faithfulness to Him and bless that effort to bring forth a harvest unto Him. Amen. God's able to do that, friends. So, the Apostle Paul, again, he pushes us forward to a greater service to God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it's verse number 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 58. Listen to this. And let this be an encouragement to you. Let's get this down in our spirit tonight. Let it be an encouragement to you. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I believe a bunch of us needed to hear that very thing tonight. Your labor is not in vain, friends. You're, you're out there laboring for the Lord, and maybe you think nobody notices, nobody sees. There's a God in heaven who sees. He notices, and He's promised you that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That blesses my soul. So Paul's saying, do not be moved. Let nothing move you. Child of God, he's saying don't be fickle in your Christian life. Don't shift from one viewpoint to another viewpoint, but get yourself a firm handle on the truth. Get yourself a firm grasp on the truth and stick with the truth, especially the truth of the risen Christ. And if you grab a hold of the truth of the risen Christ, you're not going to be so easily shaken in life. So Paul urges his readers to continue the work of the Lord and because God has the ultimate victory, everything we do for His glory, it's never going to be in vain. It's never going to be in vain. But there's more. Our chief end is not only to glorify God, but it's to enjoy Him forever. Amen? Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, this is one of the quickest, most surefire ways for you to tell if you're truly living for God. <coughs> Here it is. Are you enjoying God? Enjoying God doesn't mean you're going to enjoy your trials and your problems and your sorrows and your heartaches and your afflictions and your persecutions necessarily. But what it does mean is through those trials and persecutions and heartaches and afflictions, and everything that we go through, you can still enjoy God. That's how you get through in life. That's how we make it. The person who is living according to the purpose for which they were created, that person knows the joy that's found in the Lord. That person knows the fulfillment that's found in Jesus Christ. And they also know that while we may have some outward defeats, there's always victory in His presence. Anybody in here ever been defeated before? Outwardly? I have. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and tell you. I've suffered a few outward defeats in my life. But even during those times of outward defeat, there's still victory in His presence. And when the smoke settles and the dust clears, it doesn't matter what happens in this life. We've got victory in Jesus. Amen. Ultimate victory in Him. So how do we enjoy God? Because the chief duty of man, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's what we're preaching to you tonight. So how do we do that? How do we enjoy God? Well, we enjoy God through obedience to Him. 
We do the things that God has commanded us to do in His Word for His glory. We enjoy Him through that. We enjoy God through closeness in fellowship. We enjoy God by living in Him and for Him. We enjoy God by living in the wonderful assurance that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So to enjoy God is simply to know Him and to know Him in the person of His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to recognize the great redeeming love that comes from Him. Aren't you glad that God loves His people? Amen. I'm thankful that there's a great redeeming love that comes from Him. We'll never be able to truly enjoy life until we enjoy God because it's only then that we can be reconciled with God and reconciled with others and have peace with God. And because of the peace that we have with God, we can have peace with others. That's when we can truly have life and that more abundantly, right? It's what Jesus said. He said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. That's when you truly have that abundant life. 1 John now, 5 and 12. We're just about done tonight. 1 John 5 and 12. Listen to this. Here the Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So, when you have the Son, when you have the Son, that means you've got true faith in Him. That's what it means to have the Son. You've got true faith in Him, and it means that you're living in Him, and it means that Christ is dwelling in your heart. You have the Son. And when you have the Son, you've got faith in Him, He's dwelling in your heart. The, the Bible says you have life. Amen? If you've got the Son, you have life. And it's not just some shallow form of spiritual life, but it's eternal life. Right. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. But it says, but he who has not the Son of God, when you have not the Son of God, you have no knowledge of Him, you have no faith in Him, and you have no enjoyment of Him. That's what it means to have not the Son of God. You don't have any faith in Jesus. You don't enjoy Christ. You have no knowledge of Christ, no saving knowledge. He that hath not the Son hath not life. That means they're dead in their sins. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They don't have eternal life. They have no title to eternal life. They are separated and alienated from God because they have not the Son, and therefore they don't enjoy life. And unless there's a change that takes place, they're going to go down and face the second death. So let me close with this. This is what I want you to remember tonight. When God calms the battle within us, he gives us a life of victory and He gives us a life of joy. When man lives according to his chief end, the result for him is to gain this victory and to gain this joy. So, life on this earth has nothing whatsoever to offer apart from God. Did you catch that? Life on this earth there's nothing about living on this earth that has anything good to offer you if God's not involved in it. So that's exactly why the psalmist said back in Psalm 73 as Donna comes to the piano tonight, that's exactly why he said this. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Friend, are you glorifying God? Are you enjoying God every day? Think about that. Are you enjoying God? We should be. If you're not glorifying God, 
and you're not enjoying God, you're missing out on that, on your whole purpose for being here. You're like a saw trying to hammer a nail. Ask God to help you get on track. Ask God to help you get where you need to be. That He might be glorified and that you might enjoy Him forever. For this is the chief end of man. Let's all bow in prayer. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come humbly once again with thankful hearts. Lord, I pray, God, as this message has gone out tonight, Lord, that the Spirit of God is at work, that this message would be received, the response would be exactly what you have it to be. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand tonight, friends. If you're able, we'll stand.